we've had a couple of hurricanes off the east coast of Canada and at the Atlantic Canada has suffered a, a fair amount of damage. Last year, we had uh, problems on the west coast with uh, climate rivers and all sorts of flooding and, and wildfires have been a problem. So clearly climate change uh, is here. Uh, it, we're beginning to see the suffer the effects of it. The insurance industry uh, is talking about how that will grow over time. So I'm going to talk to Sarah Miller, who's a research associate uh, with the Climate Institute, about a new report called Damage Control, Reducing the Costs of Climate Impacts in Canada. Welcome to the interview, Sarah. Hi, thanks for having me. Now, let's start with maybe just kind of an overview here. The Everybody I talk to says that, you know, we this has been predicted for decades and decades. It seems like the, you know, the scientists' predictions have come true, that now we're we're seeing climate change not cause events, but make events much worse. Mm -hmm. And we're seeing drought in the in the California, places like that in Texas. We're seeing flooding in other places, these hurricanes that are that are more severe. Are are we expecting to see the, that uh worsen over time and and i would assume then that the 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 financial the costs of it would also be expected to rise significantly over time mm -hmm. absolutely we're already seeing the impacts of climate change in canada and around the world as you note um, and we're already seeing the economic costs of those uh, those impacts already starting to manifest so as you noted extreme weather is on the rise We've seen that in everything from Hurricane Fiona to the flooding in BC last year, increasingly intense wildfire seasons. And we've also found that, yes, damages and these extreme weather events are set to escalate over time, but it's not a far off threat. They're already here and the economy is already being damaged by, by climate change in the very near term. Like I can think of last year when the uh, the flooding uh, in the su during the summer uh, wiped out sections of Highway Number One going to the Lower Mainland. It's a major artery uh, for goods and for goods, and uh, that was a big blow uh, both to the port of uh, Port of Vancouver and to the West Coast economy, but also uh, you know on the prairies as well. So mm -hmm. let's talk first of all the the Im impact on income, and I gather that. Folks in lower income Canadians will suffer the most. Mm -hmm. Yes. So really, there's a two part story. So there's major economic impacts on national income, on the economy as a whole, which are already manifesting. So we're seeing, for example, growth being hit by twenty five billion dollars as soon as twenty twenty five. So those are macroeconomic costs that percolate through the economy. And then, as you noted, households bear the worst brunt of these climate costs. So we find that household affordability is hit extremely hard and that low income households are hit the worst. So we find that in a high emission scenario to the end of century, median households can expect to lose 19% of their income and the lowest income households can expect to lose 23%. So these are major household affordability impacts that come from climate change. And I, I imagine that these kinds of losses would come at a time when uh, families are already struggling uh, to cope with inflation. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. There's a whole host of affordability impacts that come together. And as you noted, like the household affordability is already under significant strain. And uh, we also find that climate is a major force behind issues like inflation. So we see a whole host of issues come together and um, shrinking incomes from slower economic growth. We see higher prices of everyday goods because of increasing supply chain disruptions. We see um, increased expenses, for example, cost of insurance and taxes will likely need to increase to cover uh, increasingly expensive extreme weather. So all of this comes together to reduce incomes and increase expenses, which obviously hurts Canadians. Uh, you make an interesting point in the report that the Canadian economy is highly climate sensitive. Now, I, mm -hmm. I, I grew up and spent most of most of my life on the prairies in Manitoba, mm -hmm. Saskatchewan, Alberta. And I think of forestry. You know, mm -hmm. if you've got wildfires and if you've got heavy rain, all of that will impact. And, you know, jobs might be lost. Uh, mm -hmm. Farming has got to be clearly... Uh, 
very affected by by climate, particularly droughts, but I suppose, mm-hmm. uh, you know, uh, rain as well. And uh, I mean, anything, you know, we're hewers of wood and drawers of water. We do a lot of mining. We, all of these things can be impacted by climate. So it's not hard to see why there would be job losses uh, in the Canadian economy as climate change worsens. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And one of the things that this report does helpfully is it dispels the myth that is still out there that Canada is a climate winner in some sense. So what we find is that the Canadian economy is highly climate sensitive, that almost all sectors are negatively impacted. You mentioned forestry, so we find significant declines in timber harvest volumes as a result of climate change. Um, The only sectors that benefit are the agriculture sector over the medium term does see increase in yield and construction. Everything else, um, all other sectors see significant negative impacts. And the construction industry um, seeing benefit is an interesting case because what it illustrates is the broken windows fallacy. So it illustrates the fact that the cost of responding to extreme weather events in particular is going up. So we're doing a lot more replacing infrastructure, repairing broken infrastructure that's prematurely damaged or destroyed. So that looks good for the construction sector, but that carries a heavy cost for the economy as a whole. I want to just follow up on the agriculture. I would not have expected that the impacts would be uh, beneficial beneficial for agriculture. Can you explain that, please? Mm-hmm. So I will note that it is, um, you know, not a comprehensive analysis of of agriculture. We do look at um, agriculture yields in the model, and as a result of increased temperatures, we do see net benefits for that sector. Um, It doesn't take into account all of the risks facing the sector, and there's a lot of uncertainty, obviously, the farther out you get in terms of how risks manifest. So we talk in the report about this tip of the iceberg metaphor, which basically says, you know, we can model today and quantify the most highly visible risks that are clearly in our path. (laughs) There's a lot of uncertainty about some of the more significant risks and how they can manifest and hurt Canada's economy and different sectors. So we really need to look at these results as the tip of the iceberg or the lower bound of what we can expect to see in terms of cost to the economy. Now, you do a calculation of job losses, and uh, if I've got the numbers right, job losses could double by mid-century and increase to 2.9 million by end of century. Could you unpack mm-hmm. those numbers or that number for us, please? Mm-hmm. So those numbers are right. We do see substantial job losses over the medium term and especially over the long term to the end of century, as you noted, 2.9 million in a high emission scenario. Those come largely from a drag on economic growth and from reduced labor productivity, reduced productivity in various sectors. So those macroeconomic impacts filter through the economy and result in fewer jobs, lower incomes, um, reduced productivity for various sectors of the economy. And that is just one way that, that climate change is going to hurt households. Well, let's talk about adaptation now. And your Mm -hmm. report calculates that for every dollar spent on adaptation, it saves $13 to $15. Can you explain that, please? Mm -hmm. That's one of the most novel findings of this report is the significant payback that we see from proactive adaptation. So yes, so for every dollar invested, we can expect between $13 and $15 in a low and high emissions scenario. And that uh, calculation comes from a combined direct and indirect benefits of adaptation. So of course we see direct benefits of adaptation show up as reduced costs for repairing and replacing infrastructure, for example. So you know if you're um, paving roads with more temperature uh, resilient asphalt, for example, then you can expect fewer, um, less of a need to replace that, that infrastructure and less damage. But the most impactful benefits are actually the indirect impacts, which are the way that those damages flow through the economy as a whole. So through adaptation, we can avoid some of the worst labor productivity impacts, for example, some of the worst supply chain disruptions, and that has major payback to the economy. So what other kinds of adaptations are we talking about? Like I live on you know, Vancouver Island, we, right, we have a coast, uh, we've saw, we've seen the BC coast uh, suffer mm-hmm. some damage from 
from ex extreme weather. What kind of adaptations uh, might the BC, you know, the West Coast take? I mean, are we talking about moving buildings back from the coast to protect them, you know, from soil erosion? What are we, what are we talking about? Mm -hmm. The broader conversation to that point, land use planning is essential. We have to talk about, you know, where the biggest risks are and what we do to ensure that we're not rebuilding consistently in some of the highest risk areas. Um, that's a really important conversation to have. In our report, we looked at um, a few different specific adaptation responses um, across a variety of impact areas. So everything from using more temperature resistant, um, resilient asphalt, for example, and repaving roads or building new roads, um, cooling and shading technologies. So we found, for example, that shading technology for manufacturing facilities can have major productivity benefits for in, during extreme heat. Um, coastal flooding protection, there's a variety of, of tools like that that we can deploy to, to minimize costs and, and maximize protective benefits. Well, Sarah, thank you very much for this. Really appreciate your insights. Of course. Thanks for having me on. It was nice to talk to you.